Well, it's good to see so many here tonight, and it's good to uh, see Marcus and his wife here tonight. That was a complete surprise for me. <laughs> Didn't know he was anywhere other than in Europe. Well, turn in your Bible to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to study verse 9, but... Since uh, not everyone was here last time, I studied. Maybe I'll back up just a little bit to give you the context of what we're looking at. We'll start with verse 7, Deuteronomy chapter 6. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And this is referring back to the chapter 5, which had the commandments, and uh, it adds the statutes and judgments and all in this chapter. And they were to pass on this information to their children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, or it's like saying all day, you need to pass on to your children the instruction that I've given you. But nine changes to another interesting aspect. Um, well, verse eight, first, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And unfortunately, the Jews in the time of Jesus and probably quite some time before put verses of Scripture and the commandments on their wrists and they put things on their forehead. That wasn't what it was talking about. It was telling us that whatever our hands do should be guided by God's instructions and whatever we allow our mind to think about should be guided by God's instructions. And that children were to be brought up uh, appreciating that wisdom that God had given. But now we come to one that is tangible as far as, you know, being literal. Verse 9, And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. <clears throat> So when you came to their property, you could see that it was a, a Jewish property, or they were Israel back then. Uh, when this got started, you could see it was an Israelite home, because you saw the commandments on the gate. And then when you went in the door of their house, you saw the commandments on there. And, uh, you know, today we don't follow that practice per se, but I have seen people uh, on their bathroom mirror write out some scripture and different places of the house have scripture where they can uh, remember that particular thought. So I suppose that's somewhat similar. And at Wildwood, uh, for many years, there's been a practice as people walk the trails You'll see a plaque on a tree, and it's got a text of Scripture there. There's a bench to sit on, and there's a text of Scripture on the bench, which will remind people. So, uh, apparently there is a, a place for uh, having it visible, not just in our Bible, but having it visible where we are reminded. And uh, here we see a kind of a synopsis of what God did on this from Prophets and Kings, page 464 and 5. In the days of the wilderness wandering, the Lord had made abundant provision for his children to keep in remembrance the words of his law. Now those that brought your syllabus are on page 42. What is that abundant provision? Well, here it gives a list. After abundant provision for his children to keep in remembrance the words of his law. 
After the settlement in Canaan, the divine precepts were to be repeated daily in every home. So apparently, they were to quote the Ten Commandments every day in their home. They were to be written plainly upon the doorposts and gates and spread upon memorial tablets. Now, if you study that history, you discover that as soon as they got in Canaan, one of their first duties was to set up this monument in the middle of the land. And they hadn't even conquered it yet, but they walked, they marched to the center of the land. They made this memorial, and God kept anybody from bothering them while they could do that. And ever after, anyone that passed that way could read the Ten Commandments on that monument. They were to be set to music and chanted by young and old. So they sang them as well. That's probably how they repeated them in the home, because it's a lot easier to remember Bible verses if we sing them. Priests were to teach these holy precepts in public assemblies. So they were to make sure the people, just in case they failed at home, to teach it. The priests were to teach it so that everyone had no reason to not be aware. And the rulers of the land were to make them their daily study. When we get to Deuteronomy 17, we'll discover that God, of course, he didn't want to have a king, but he knew they would want one, so he gave regulations for the king. And one of the regulations was that he would study the commandments and the word of God every day. That he would have a copy and that he would study it every day, obviously, so that he would lead the people in the way that God asked. And uh, I believe that's a qualification for leadership. Anyone that's a leader is supposed to be studying and finding out what God has said about what we're supposed to do. Uh, seventh Manuscript Release, page 357 and 8. The instruction given to Moses for Israel is timely instruction for eight. Excuse me, for us. And then, I didn't put it in, but it quotes Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. When we bring our lives to complete obedience to the law of God regarding God as our supreme guide and clinging to Christ as our hope of righteousness, God will work in our behalf. Now, that doesn't mean he doesn't work ahead of that. He works to bring us to him, and he works according to what we practice. And But what I think it's saying in this context is that he works more. The more people are willing to listen to what he said and do it, that gives him the privilege to work even in a more powerful way. So... God will work in our behalf. This is a righteousness of faith. In other words, how do we get that obedient? By faith. That's how we become obedient. A righteousness hidden in a mystery of which the worldling knows nothing and which he cannot understand. Now, some of us could be tempted to think we're already practicing everything. But we might not be. <laughs> because if we were, then we could read the whole Bible, the whole spirit of prophecy, and it would never tell us to do anything we're not doing. So uh, most of us still have some work to do to come in line with what God has explained 
for us to do. And anything that he tells us to do all traces back to the Ten Commandments. Everything arises from that. And it's simply an amplification explaining what that really means. Now that ends that little uh, section. And it begins another very interesting one, starting in verse 10. And we'll read 10 through 12 and then take a look at, at that. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Now we have to remember that it hadn't happened yet. And so God was telling them in very positive language, it's going to happen. When you get there, this is going to be your danger. Be careful, because blessings can cause trouble. Now, everybody wants blessings, right? A lot of our prayer time is spent asking for blessings. But when we get the blessings, often we're not told there's danger in the blessings. And they longed to be able to get in that land that God told them flowed with milk and honey, and now he's telling them not only is it full of milk and honey, but you're going to get the results of these people's work, some of whom were giants and so on. You can imagine what they could create and do, and you're going to get it all without any work other than, you know, letting me help you uh, win the battles. And when you get in there, now there's a danger that you will forget who brought you in, who did all that for you. Now, always, as we study this, there's a spiritual application, you know. The Old Testament is full of righteousness by faith. It's not just the new. What God is saying here is that when I work the miracle in your heart to deliver you from the interest of sinning, and when I uh, cleanse you from the desire to do wrong, and you start living a better life, there's a danger that you start thinking you're doing it. You start getting lifted up in your own eyes because you can see that you're different from what you were before. And any blessing that God gives, doesn't matter what it is, there is a danger, and some people fall into it, that they get lifted up in their own eyes, and then they go backward, and they fall. And so this is a warning, really, for all of us. Now, in Ezekiel, chapter 16, verse 49, we see that this was the problem that led to the destruction of Sodom. In Ezekiel 16, 49, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. So two problems. Sodom had everything they wanted, but they didn't use it to help the poor and needy. And so it was a serious problem. But notice what caused it. Pride, fullness of bread. And you remember what Jesus said to the Jewish nation, that if, 
they had heard the things at Sodom that had been preached to the Jews, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. So we're, when we talk about Sodom, we're not talking about something far away from us. We're talking about something that's a danger for the people of God, for Seventh-day Adventists, to become <coughs> proud <coughs> because of the blessings of God, not only spiritually, but physically, generally, Seventh-day Adventists are blessed physically. They have what they need and what they want. They don't have to beg for anything. They're blessed in, in every way, but that has its dangers. Now let's look at a few cases of people that had this problem. Uh, Saul is the first one that we'll look at. And uh, we'll read from Patriarchs and Prophets 633. Though when first called to the throne, Saul was humble and self-distrustful. You remember what he did when it was time for them to for him to be announced? He hid. He was embarrassed. He didn't feel worthy of being the king. So he was humble and self-distrustful, but success made him self-confident. We all want success, don't we? And we usually choose leaders from people that we think are successful, not realizing the danger of success. But <clears throat> success made him self-confident. The very first victory of his reign had kindled that pride of heart, which was his greatest danger. One victory. <clears throat> Shows how fast, you know, you have a sin that you're struggling with and God gives you the victory. One victory can get you lifted up in your own eyes. Now, the good thing about sin is that if you get lifted up, you'll fall. So it wakes you up. The next time you'll think, oh, what happened? I had victory before, but I don't have it now. What's the matter? And the danger, though, is that pride sometimes goes on and you don't admit what's, what's happening. But in this case, uh, you know, Saul didn't really recognize it, but he got lifted up more and more with the success. Then we have David. Now, God tried hard for David to protect him from not getting lifted up. Patriarchs and Prophets, 746 the history of David affords one of the most impressive testimonials, testimonies ever given to the dangers that threaten the soul from power and riches and worldly honor. So there's three areas that are very, very dangerous. Power, you've heard the statement that... Uh, yeah, po uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So there we see why the Pope becomes like he does. Because he is enabled somehow to gain tremendous power. And when the more power you have, the more you are in danger of being corrupted. Now God doesn't get corrupted with all power, so... It, it doesn't have to happen, but it often does, especially in human beings. Power, and then there's riches. And you know, the years that I've spent in places where the income is quite small, I can see that people can get pretty selfish about not much and be grasping when there's not much to grasp after. But, uh, you know, anything has the potential to corrupt us. Then it goes on. Those things that are most eagerly desired among men. Few have ever passed through an experience better adapted 
to prepare them for enduring such a test. Now, it starts out going back to David's young life. David had enjoyed precious experiences of the love of God and had been richly endowed with his spirit. So as, he, as a boy, that's why he was chosen to be king. He had such a wonderful relationship with God. It was, it was called a man after God's own heart because he just had such a wonderful relationship with God. And in that, God was preparing him for the future. In the history of Saul, he had seen the utter worthlessness of mere human wisdom. So now he gets to witness what happens when a man becomes proud and lifted up in his own eyes. And as a result, he did terrible things, including wanting to kill David. So here he saw all that as a warning. David, don't follow that path. And yet, worldly success and honor so weakened the character of David that he was repeatedly overcome by the tempter. Wow. So God worked hard to prepare him so he wouldn't do it, but he did it anyway. As he got the position of king, you can see why God didn't want a king, because it's very destructive. In fact, as I have spent a few years of not being a president, well, I can't say I'm not a president of something, but it's not much. <laughs> and uh, as I look back, I can see the harmful effects of that. And the Lord has had to help me on some things to come back to earth again. <laughs> Then we have uh, another quote about David, Patriarchs and Prophets 716. But in the midst of prosperity lurked danger. When we have prosperity in any area of life, if people think we're wonderful, you know, and they talk about us being so wonderful, there's danger in that. If we have financial success, there's danger in that. If we seem to be resisting the sins that we used to commit, there's danger in all that. <clears throat> in the time of his greatest outward triumph, David was in the greatest peril and met his most humiliating defeat. So the worst mistake that he ever made was at the pinnacle of success. He didn't have to go to war anymore. He had things under control. He had men trained that could do it for him. And he didn't need to go anymore. And that's when the devil found him and led him astray. Patriarchs and Prophets 717, all the lessons of Bible history teach, how many? All. It is a perilous thing to praise or exalt men. For if one comes to lose sight of his entire dependence on God and to trust to his own strength, he is sure to fall. I try to keep in mind the, what I heard about one of the great preachers. I forget which one it was, but he was standing at the door shaking hands as people left. And uh, there was a woman who was praising him for his wonderful sermon that he had preached. And he said, Sister, the devil told me that already. <laughs> he tried to help her understand this is not a good thing. You can ruin me. 
And you know what group of people I think we ruin the fastest? Are the musicians among us. We ruin them very fast. To where, uh, you know, I, you can't read hearts, I, I realize. But <clears throat> I've had to deal with some of these professional singers, and boy, they can get offended. I mean, just like that. They think you ought to really think they're wonderful, and uh, I think we ruin a lot of our musicians by praising them so much about how good their music is. It was the spirit of self-confidence and self-exaltation that prepared the way for David's fall. Flattery and the subtle allurements of power and luxury were not without effect upon him. Now, I didn't uh, feel that people flattered me, but what I noticed was they treat the president different than other people. And the difference between being a regular worker and being a president is very different the way people treat. And it was in the same institution <laughs> that I was not the president and I was the president. It was very, very different. And so that preferred treatment that you get has its effect. And David experienced all of that, and apparently it was even beyond just preferential treatment. It was flattery and so on, and over time it had its effect. Also on the very next page of Patriarchs and Prophets, David was surrounded by the fruits of victory and the honors of his wise and able rule. So everywhere he looked, he could see that he had been very successful. That, And I suppose he gave God the credit. You know, I mean, a person that's a follower of God doesn't say, well, it was mine. You know, I did it myself. No. They give God the credit and say, look what God has been able to do, you know, through me type thing. It was now, while he was at ease and unguarded, that the tempter seized the opportunity to occupy his mind. The fact that God had taken David into so close connection with himself and had manifested so great favor toward him should, here's the way it's supposed to be, should have been to him the strongest of incentives to preserve his character unblemished. So the way God wants us to look at it is when we get blessed, to praise God for it, to thank God for it, and not take any credit, and realize that it's all him. Yes. Yes, yes. But... It's very insidious that slowly you begin to take some of the credit. That, that's what happened to David. But it's supposed to be a reminder of giving God the credit, recognizing it's not you, and so on. But when in ease and self-security he let go his hold upon God, David yielded to Satan and brought upon his soul the stain of of guilt. And I'm sure you've studied his life. He ruined the whole rest of his life. He, he never was able to really have what he used to have by way of respect and, and you know, working and, and God's benefit and so on. He ruined the whole rest of his life. Now, he still will be saved, praise the Lord. So, you know, uh, he will get much in the future, but what a shame. You know, I always think when a, when a pastor or somebody who's a leader commits adultery and ruins the rest of their life, you know, what a shame that they would go for a time and be God's instrument and then they would throw it all away, ruin it. Patriarchs and Prophets 722 and 3. 
Through successive generations, infidels have pointed to the character of David bearing this dark stain and have exclaimed in triumph and derision, this is a man after God's own heart? So the mistake that David made has had terrible results. Terrible results. Thus, a reproach has been brought upon religion. God and his word have been blasphemed. Souls have been hardened in unbelief. And many, under a cloak of piety, have become bold in sin. You say, well, David did it. So, you know, it can't be that bad for me to do it. Wow. David had no idea the damage that he was going to do when he made that decision. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure did. And it still happens, even now. But the history of David furnishes no countenance to sin. You see, if you study the whole story, problem is people don't, but if you study the whole story, there's no uh, reason. He got punished plenty. It made plain. This is not acceptable. It was when he was walking in the counsels of God that he was called a man after God's own heart. When he sinned, this ceased to be true of him until by repentance he had returned to the Lord. And that's a very key sentence, I believe, because people misinterpret and misapply the statement that David was a man after God's own heart. He was before this incident, and he was after because he genuinely repented. But he was not during that time a man after God's own heart. So it's not right to apply that phrase to that period of his life. Then we go to Solomon. And, uh, well, maybe I'm going to skip that one for now. I'll come back to it. I have Solomon next and Luther. But I want to get to, uh, to Kellogg because this is a very interesting quote about Kellogg. Now, from my study, he was the most successful physician, the most capable physician that this church has ever had. And it was incredible what God did through him. And he could have done even more. This is from Councils on Health 367 and 8. It is a dangerous age for any man who has talents which can be of value in the work of God. So, are we going to say, I don't want talents? No, that's not what it's saying. But it's just saying, if you have talents, beware. It's a dangerous time for anybody that has talents. For Satan is constantly plying his temptations upon such a person, ever trying to fill him with pride and ambition. And when God would use him, in nine cases out of ten, he becomes independent, self-sufficient, and feels capable of standing alone. Take the nine or the ten most successful men in the Adventist church. Take ten of them. How many does it say are going to make a mistake? Nine out of ten. That's pretty serious. In nine cases out of ten, he becomes independent self-sufficient, and feels capable of standing alone. This will be your danger, Dr. Kellogg. So he got a personal 
a letter telling him, this will be your danger, Dr. Kellogg, unless you live a life of constant faith and prayer. That's the only hope we have. A life of constant faith and prayer. You may have a deep and abiding sense of eternal things and that love for humanity which Christ has shown in his life. A close connection with heaven will give the right tone to your fidelity and will be the ground of your success. Your feeling of dependence will drive you to prayer and your sense of duty summon you to effort. But as, as Kellogg became more popular and there was more work to do, he started sliding a little bit with the prayer time. Because, you know, it's, these people need me. We need to take care of these things. And as the prayer decreased, he got lifted up. Prayer and effort, effort and prayer, will be the business of your life. You must pray as though the efficiency and praise were all due to God. And labor as though duty were all your own. That's a very interesting combination. We're to work as hard as if the outcome depends totally on us. But at the same time, to pray because we realize that the success that comes is all God's. And, and if we don't pray, we're not going to have the right kind of success. We might have success, but it won't be the right kind. You must pray as though the efficiency and praise were all due to God, and labor as though duty were all your own. If you want power, you may have it. See, it's dangerous, but God gives it. As it is awaiting your draft upon it, only believe in God, take him at his word, act by faith, and blessings will come. What a message to Dr. Kellogg and to anyone that has talents and abilities in doing God's work or any work, but especially we're thinking of God's work. In this matter, genius, logic, and eloquence will not avail. Those who have a humble, trusting, contrite heart, God accepts and hears their prayer. And when God helps, all obstacles will be overcome. But it's when God helps. It's not because of us. Even though we work as though it all depends on us. How many men of great natural abilities and high scholarship have failed when placed in positions of responsibility while those of feebler intellect with less favorable surroundings, have been wonderfully successful. <laughs> Interesting. The secret was the former trusted to themselves, while the latter united with him, who is wonderful in counsel and mighty in working to accomplish what he will. So, often God has to choose humble instruments. But as we've read, the humble instrument can get lifted up too. But he often has to use humble instruments. And some of them, at least, keep their hold on him. And he does mighty things with them. Your work being always urgent, it is difficult for you to secure time for meditation and prayer. But this you must not fail to do. Well, he must have failed to do it because he lost his way. Of course, there were other factors, and we won't go into those here. 
In closing, I want to uh, close with Ellen White because hers was a success story. <laughs> you know, Mo most of these were failures, but Ellen White was a success. From Life Sketches, page 71 and 2. One great fear that had oppressed me was that if I obeyed the call of duty and went out declaring myself to be one favored of the Most High with visions and revelations for the people, I might yield to sinful exaltation and be lifted above the station that was right for me to occupy, bring upon myself the displeasure of God, and lose my own soul. So, Ellen White didn't even want the job of being a prophet. Can you imagine the temptations to a prophet to feel like they're special and that they, you know, deserve something beyond other people? And so she didn't want to take the job. And she knew exactly why she didn't want the job, because she was afraid of getting lifted up in her own eyes. I had known of such cases, and my heart shrank from the trying ordeal. I now entreated that if I must go and relate what the Lord had shown me, I should be preserved from undue exaltation, said the angel. Your prayers are heard and shall be answered. If this evil that you dread threatens you, the hand of God will be stretched out to save you by affliction. He will draw you to himself and preserve your humility. Now, I'm not saying that's the only reason Ellen White had so much sickness, but that's probably the reason why some of sickness came to her. Yes. No human being is that good. And a cautionary tale, that line for a pope to say, we stand in the place of God Almighty in the earth. Yeah. <laughs> that's a setup for exaltation, isn't it? Well... So it is possible, and I believe God is calling us to be, to have that fear like Ellen White did. And, and if he has to make us sick or, you know, several times I've been removed from office in sort of an unkind way. Um, that was probably part of the God's plan, you know, also to protect me. But whatever happens, uh, if, if we're really willing for God to protect us against this, it sounds like he will do it. <laughs> and keep us from making that serious mistake that so many have done in the past. So may that be our approach to whatever, you know, talents or abilities that we have. And may we learn from the mistakes of others not to go down that path. Well, let's pray as we close. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we're so thankful for all the lessons that we can learn from the word. And this one, we see that the Israelites and later the Jews, they did get corrupted by all the blessings that came upon them. They didn't remember this passage, and we see that down through history, so many have become corrupted. Lord, we want to pay attention. We want to be like Ellen White, to plead with you that you would protect us. We know you need to use us to accomplish the finishing of your work, but help us to see the danger so fully and so completely that we will plead with you to protect us. If it takes sickness, if it takes uh, events that, that hurt or bring pain, whatever it takes, we want to be among those that are faithful in carrying whatever responsibility you give to us. And we, we need the blessings, and yet we see there's a danger in it, even in our own Christian life. Lord, help us to always give all the credit to you for any resistance of temptation, any advancement, any 
person who joins the church because of our efforts. Help us in everything to give all the credit to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week I said I'd be here, but I, I can't, so uh, Don is going to take charge of next week. There's a medical, I should mention this in case anybody wants to go, there's a medical missionary convention, an international medical missionary convention at Oakwood College. It's headed by uh, three of our self-supporting people. Jim Ayoto is, is the one leading out. He's was a former student of Wildwood. And uh, Dr. Grievous is also on, on the team, and Dr. Urban Davis that used to work at Wildwood. And so there starts Thursday night uh, with the first meeting, 7.30, and then it, it goes through Sabbath. So if anybody wants to go to that, well, I'm sure they'd be glad for you, yes. Is that next week? Next weekend, starting next Thursday. Thursday and all yeah. day Friday. Yeah, and all day Friday and all day Sabbath. Thank you. They've asked me to to give four messages there. I don't know what the attendance will be, you know, how big it is, because it's headed up. But they got Elder Wilson to, uh, uh, they were hoping he would come physically, and I'm not sure, they haven't told me for sure whether he will or not. But he probably will just have a recorded message introducing uh, his approval of this uh, seminar.